Hybrid shooters, what's going on? It's Jason Bong, and it's been a little over a month since the Sony A7S III has been out, and so far, I've been loving it. Everyone's review on this camera has been spectacular. However, a lot of the useful information are scattered all over the interwebs, so I decided to compile a list of things that new Sony A7S III users need to be aware of and how to navigate through some of these potential issues should you come across them. Starting off with number one, you and your computer may not be ready to edit 10-bit 422. Everybody's been screaming for Sony to include internal 10-bit 422 in their mirrorless cameras for years now, and now that we got it, new users such as myself are getting slapped in the face with sluggish playback in our editing software. Obviously, those who have dealt with these files before from different cameras would know what to do. But now that 10-bit 422 has become a lot more accessible to a wider demographic, more people will soon start to find out they will need to generate proxies before they can edit these files, whether it's transcoding to ProRes or Cineform. According to my buddy Max Yurev, the reason why most modern machines struggle to edit 10-bit 422 the way that it is is because there isn't the hardware to properly decode it. He actually recommends shooting in 10-bit 420 XAVC HS 4K because that's the most efficient codec and decodable by machines that exist within the last three years. So unless you're handing off the footage to a colorist, I wouldn't worry about shooting in 422. For quick projects and YouTube videos like this, 10-bit 420 works great. Moving on to number two, however, if you choose to do the color grading yourself with the introduction of 10-bit now, grading with S-Log3 has become a lot more viable. However, if you've been struggling to get the colors right in the past, check out these amazing S-Log LUTs. Alistair Chapman from xdcam-user.com actually makes these really good Venice look LUTs which you can drop onto your S-Log footage and it will already look amazing. If you don't already know him, he's an OG. He's a legend with Sony cinema cameras and he makes a ton of great content not only working with S-Log footage but as well as other industry stuff as well. The LUTs are free but do consider supporting him via donations. No, he did not ask me to plug him, he doesn't even know who I am but I've been his blog reader for years now and it's a way for me to give back. Try it out. If you like it, return back to his website and donate him to support his LUTs as well as the other great contents that he puts out. Moving on to number three, S and Q, which stands for slow and quick, allows you to shoot and playback slow motion in real time. And in the A7S III, it's got a huge bitrate bump. Before, it was something ridiculously low on the other models, but if you need to spin out a quick project out, the 100 megabits per second 10-bit 422 or 420 will give you enough wiggle room for color grading. But just remember this, this method of slow motion does not record audio. If audio is important in the project that you're working on, shoot 4K60 or 4K120 the regular way. Number four, speaking of bit rates, the Sony A7S III can record at a higher bit rate, which you probably know, 600 megabits per second, and you might possibly be considering getting the new CF Express cards. Now I do wanna say this, unless you're really opting for optimal quality, then shooting with SD cards are gonna be just fine. CF Express Type A cards, not only are they pricey, but at the time of this recording, they're still not available yet. But don't worry, if you still want to shoot with all that 600 megabits per second, the Sony G cards will be able to handle it. So if you don't need to be shooting with all that data, which most people won't, don't worry about getting the CF Express just yet. Number five, I'm gonna have to give everybody a reality check here. Just because the camera is amazing in low light and it can literally see into the darkness, doesn't mean your footage still won't look like crap. Most people think the low light capability on the Sony A7S series is the answer to all of their low light problems. That is a big no. Of course, if you're caught in a pinch, the extreme low light capabilities can be helpful. Using lighting and lighting things properly will always create a far better look than trying to shoot with high ISO and minimal lighting. Which brings me to the next point. Be aware of dual ISO. 
And this finding comes from my good friend, Gerald Undone, who is a super detail guy, who is super technical about these things. And I'll link his video somewhere here on the screen as well as description box below so you can better understand this. But essentially, there are two base ISO on the Sony a7S III, one at 640 and the other at 16,000. If you're pushing the ISO towards 12,800, the dynamic range takes a dip. So when you're pushing the colors and the exposure hard in post-production, you'll see noise and grain. However, if you instead go past 12,800 up to 16,000, that's when things starts to clean up and the dynamic range improves again. So if you're pushing the grade, it will look better at this point. Before we move on to the rest of the list, I just want to give Vessi, these everyday sneakers that are 100% waterproof, a quick shout out for sponsoring a portion of this video. As a hybrid shooter, I often find myself in unfavorable conditions and often need to go the extra mile to get the shot. And sometimes it involves getting my feet wet, quite literally. Because these Vessi shoes are 100% waterproof, I don't have to worry about wet socks for the rest of the shoot. You know that feeling of wet socks the entire way back home after a shoot? It sucks. I've been wearing these Vessi shoes for about a month now and they're incredibly easy to clean. Just a quick rinse in a shower and allow one day for them to dry. What's great about Vessi, in addition to them being waterproof shoes, are that they're actually stylish everyday sneakers, so you don't have to always wear them in crazy situations. And all pairs of their shoes are sustainably made, which is great for the environment. So check Vessi out, they actually have a Black Friday sale going on right now. And if you're watching after Black Friday, use my code VON to save $25 off. Thanks for listening. It really does help me create more helpful content like this. Now back to the video. Number seven, you still cannot shoot with Super 35 mode in 4K. You can only do this in 1080p. Unfortunately, when you're shooting in 4K and you mount an APS-C lens, it does not auto crop in to avoid the massive vignetting. And I bring this up because other models like the a7 III and the a7R can shoot in both full frame and super 35 mode in 4K. If you've never shot with the a7S series before, you likely have never known about this. This is because of the 12 megapixel sensor size. There's not enough pixel for it to crop in one and a half times and still record 4K in high quality. However, there is a workaround to this. Clear image zoom. This supposed magic right here retains a lot of the visual quality while zooming into the frame. It's in its name, clear image zoom. It's not the same as digital zoom where the quality does take a dip. Clear image zoom uses some sort of complex algorithm to still make the footage look great. This is gonna be helpful for those who still plan on using some APS-C lenses, especially those who own Super 35 cinema lenses or the new Su-ray anamorphic lenses that are designed for the Super 35 sensor. So keep this in mind and run some tests before your next shoot. Moving on to number eight, you already know active stabilization. It's great to smooth out some of your handheld shots, but it does crop in 10% of your footage. Not a bad trade-off, but if you don't need it, you gotta remember to turn it off. Sometimes that 10% of your screen real estate can make a huge difference, especially if you're shooting with an ultra wide angle lens. Number nine, potential issues you might come across when using Catalyst Browse. Chances are you probably heard of this amazing post-stabilization software where it uses the recorded gyro data provided by the camera for better footage stabilization. With the gyro data, it does a far better job than any warp stabilization can in your typical editing software. The trick is you need to turn off all image stabilization in camera and crank up the shutter speed. Then you throw the footage into Catalyst for stabilization. Now, the reason why you want to turn off all image stabilization in the camera is because one, you don't want any other types of internal stabilization by the camera or the lens to be baked into the footage. But also, number two, you want to maximize the screen real estate as much as possible since stabilization will be cropping into your footage. And the more that it crops, the worse the footage looks. So shoot a little wider if you can and try to shoot as steady as you can for the best results. But another thing to keep in mind if you plan on using Catalyst Browse is that you need to avoid shooting in XAVC HS. We recommended this at the beginning of the video, but it turns out the codec is currently not supported with Catalyst Browse. Instead, you need to be shooting in XAVC 
S 4K or SI if you plan on using Catalyst Browse for post stabilization. And lastly, one minor thing, users have been reporting that if you shoot in 120 frames per second, no gyro data will be recorded, so Catalyst Browse will not be able to post stabilize any of your 120 frames per second footage. Likely not going to be a huge deal if you plan on slowing down your footage by 20% anyways. Moving on to number 10, face autofocus, eye autofocus, touch tracking autofocus, all still work in 4K even when you have an external monitor plugged in and the screen does not black out when you hit the record button. Though I must warn you, if you do use touch, just do it gently or else you could introduce some shake into your footage. Number 11, the Sony a7S III takes full size HDMI. It may not sound like a big deal, but as someone who owns a lot of the other Sony cameras, I have a lot of HDMI to micro HDMI cables. RIP small HD focus users. While I do own a lot of full size to full size HDMI cables, they were actually bought with the intention of using it on the TV with my other devices, so they're a bit too long and a bit too thick. So I have been investing in smaller ones. Personally, I've been enjoying these cables from nanoseconds. They are thin and a good length for a setup like this, and I'll have a link to them in the description box below. Number 12, and of course, since people will always be asking, what about the overheating on this camera? Now, if you've never left the Sony a7S II cam, a ton has changed. Overheating was more of a problem back in 2015. The Sony a7S III actually has a lot of reworked internals that allow for better cooling, and from the tests that I've seen, people have been reporting they're able to record up to two hours without the warning signal even popping up. However, if you find yourself in extreme hot environment where you yourself might overheat, I would suggest enabling auto power temperature to high. And finally, something that I personally am super excited about as a hybrid shooter, you can now have settings that are different for stills and videos. So let's just say you're doing photos with high speed sync, you're jacking up your shutter speed to 4000, you wanna be shooting RAWs with standard profiles, but then you need to quickly flip over to video with a proper shutter speed for slow motion and you need to be shooting an S-Log. But when you flip over to video, it still retains the high shutter speed and the standard profile, so you will need to go through all of your settings again just to shoot the video in its proper setting. But now you can set it in a way where you can tell the camera to keep one specific setting for photos and the other settings for video. With the older models, it does take a lot more time to do all the custom programming, but with the Sony a7S III, you can really dial it in when you're on the spot shooting. And this is something that I would love to see in the other Sony models outside of the a7S III. Let me know in the comments down below what other things I missed in this video that new a7S III users absolutely need to know. And if you think I got it all covered, let me know in the comments down below what aspect of this camera have you been enjoying the most. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.